So, this one's gonna be about frugality or frugality, whatever it is actually called. I don't know. And uh, therefore, we're also gonna talk about from rags to riches quite once again, but this time we're gonna go through a bunch of stories and see how some people maybe did it and uh, which life they had before they became very, very, very wealthy. One of them might be Mark Cuban, who is now net worth at 4 billion, somehow around that. But yeah, there's gonna be more after the intro. As always. And with that being said, hello, welcome back to the next episode of the Self Development with Tactics podcast. And I'm looking forward to this episode. You know, this episode is gonna be a good one. I know it's gonna be one that changes your mind. Hopefully. You know, <laughs> I hope I'm gonna do that. I hope I'm gonna be able to just make that. And I hope that this episode is gonna be something that's interesting for you. So if it is interesting, please remember hitting the like button and also subscribing to the channel and to the you to the podcast. Yeah to the podcast and the channel, to the YouTube channel. And the podcast is down in the description as well as all the articles that we are gonna go through today and all the things that I might be referencing and, and whatnot. So everything should be down in the description most often. You know, it should be, sometimes it's not, most often it's not. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, I, I try to do it. You know, sometimes I fail just because I, I don't remember that I'm sometimes I'm too lazy for doing it because, uh, yeah, kind of I just, you know, close the tabs on the browser or in the browser and then I just lose the things basically. Um, I can go into my history. Yeah, I can. But yeah, you know, never mind. Let's go through some crazy stories or, well, interesting stories. And the article is called, and by the way, from the ink.com website. 17, okay, I can't scroll, never mind. 17 billionaires who started out dirt poor. When in need of inspiration from real life rags to riches tales, look to these CEOs. Are they all CEOs? You know, I actually doubt that, you know, because you do not actually have to be a CEO to just become a billionaire, nor vice versa, some kind of. But yeah, some of the world's hell healthiest and also wealthiest people started out dirt poor. These 17 Rex to Riches story remind us that through a determination, grit and a little bit of luck, anyone can overcome their circumstances and achieve extraordinary success. We all can, yeah? We indeed all can. This is an update uh, of a story originally written by Vivian Jiang. It would be interesting to see if it is kind of in terms of the whole one, of the whole article, or if it is only about the first guy, which is the Russian business tycoon and Chelsea football club owner, which is something, by the way, that I didn't know, uh, Roman, or Roman, Roman Abromovich. I uh, was born into poverty and orphaned at age two, whatever orphaned means. A child whose parents are dead. Well, well, you know, that, that's sad. That, that really is sad. And his net worth at this point in time is 8.2 billion. Uh, Bromovich was born in southern Russia into poverty. After being orphaned at age two, he was raised by an uncle and his family in a sub-Arctic region of northern Russia. While a student at the Moscow uh, Auto Transport Institute in 1987, he started a small company producing plastic toys, which helped him eventually found an oil business and make a name for himself within the oil industry. Later, as sole leader of the Sipnev company, he completed a merger that made it the fourth Biggest oil company in the world. The company was sold as state-run gas titan, uh, Gazprom, or Gazprom, whatever it is actually pronounced, I don't, I don't know, in 2005 for 13 billion. He acquired the Chelsea Football Club in 2003 and owns the world's largest yard, which costs him almost 400 million in 2010. What the fuck? But I still believe that he is just doing quite well his, with his money, you know. Most often I kind of feel like that those people that really went from so fucking poor to, to really rich, that they know how to save and they know how to be frugal, which is also going to be something that we're going to talk about a little bit later, you know. But first of all, we're going to go through a bunch of stories here. Um, but still, like, I really believe that, you know, because if, you have, if you're born into a rich family, I think... Well, it depends, you know, it always depends. It always depends on uh, how, which people are around you and like all these things, like it heavily depends on circumstances. It heavily depends on, on the people, you know. I do not really want to generalize things here, but I most often feel that those people that went from really low to really high, that they just know how to save money, how to make money as well, and to just, you know, use their money in a proper way. You know, but, you know, there as well. It depends on the person, it depends on the situation, it depends on multiple and various things. The second one is Mont 
Pellier, whatever rugby club president and entrepreneur of the year, Mohed Altrat, survived on one meal a day when he moved to France. What the fuck? Born into a nomadic tribe or a nomadic tribe in the Syrian desert to a poor mother who was raped by his father and died when he was young, Altrat was raised in his grandmother, by his grandmother, sorry, who banned him from attending school in Raqqa, the city that is now capital of ISIS. Altrad attended school anyway, and when he moved to France to attend university, he knew no French and lived off of one meal a day. Still, he earned a PhD in computer science, worked for some leading French companies, and eventually bought a failing uh, scaffolding company, which he transformed into one of the world's leading manufacturers of scaffolding and cement mixers, which is the Altrad Group. Well, in the end, it's the Ultra Group, but I don't know if the company itself was named originally the Altrad Group. You know, because group most often means that it is a group of different companies. You know. <laughs> he has previously been named French Entrepreneur of the Year and World Entrepreneur of the Year. Which is amazing, you know, to be called something like that. The next one is Kenny Trout, the founder of Excel Communications, paid his way through college by selling life insurance. What? Um, now he's net worth at 1.5 billion. The other one, by the way, because I think I've forgotten about it, is now net worth 1 billion. Trout... I hope he's. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. But Trout grew up with a bartender dad and a, and paid for his own tu tuition of Southern Illinois University by selling life insurance. He made most of his money from phone company Axel Communications, which he founded in 1988 and took public in 1996. Two years later, Trout emerged or merged his company with Teleglobe in a 3.5 billion deal, and he's now retired and invests heavily in racehorses. You know, if it works, why not? The next one is a pretty interesting one, which is Howard Schultz. Um, he uh, acquired Starbucks uh, relatively early. Like, he, he didn't found it. Basically, he only acquired it, but then made it to a global fucking multi-billion dollar business. You know, and he's now worth 2.9 billion. And I guess Starbucks is around 100 billion, something like that. Which is, by the way, something that I didn't know before. Um, before I actually talked about it on the podcast episode as well. And like it is a fucking huge company. Like it is insane. It is insane which kind of huge company it is. Uh, in an interview with British tabloid or tableau, Miro Schultz says, Growing up, I, was, I always felt like I was living on the other side of the, of the tracks. I knew the people on the other side had more resources, more money, happier families. And for some reason, I don't know why or how, I wanted to climb over that fence and achieve something beyond what people were saying was possible. I may have a suit and tie on now, but I know where I am from and I know what it is like. Schultz ended up winning a football scholarship to the University of Northern Michigan and went to work for Xerox after graduation. He then took over a coffee shop called Starbucks, which at the time had only 60 jobs, quote unquote only. Like it is still, I think he still paid quite a lot for Starbucks. You know, I think it, it really wasn't a low price, you know, because 60 shops... I mean, it has to say something. Like, it's, it's not a worldwide company as it is now with 16,000 outlets, which is fucking insane. Um, but still, 60 shops is still a really good beginning, at least in my point of view. Then the next one is investor Ken uh, Langan's parents worked as a plumber and cafeteria worker. I kind of have a feeling or I kind of wonder if I should go through all of them. Well, let's actually read all the names and, and their story or their little biography and then decide what to really go through because I really also want to talk about frugality today. The sixth one is Oprah and she was born into poverty and is now uh, the first African-American TV correspondent in Tennessee, which is nice. Then John Paul de Shora, I guess, the man behind, behind the hair care empire and Patron Tequila. Once lived in a foster home in his car, which is fucked up. At one time, businessman Shahid Khan washed dishes for 1.20 fucking dollars an hour. Forever 21 founder Do Wan Chang worked as a janitor and as a gas station attendant and in a coffee shop when he first moved to the US. Ralph Lauren was once a clerk at Brooks Brothers, dreaming of man's ties. Steel Lacoon Lakshmi Mittal. Okay. came from modest beginnings in India. Luxury good mogul Francois Pinot, I guess, quit high school in 1974 after being bullied for being poor. And he's now fucking worth, or net worth, 14.2 billion. It is insane. Uh, Leonardo del Vecchio, 
grew up in an orphanage and later worked in a factory where he lost part of his finger. What the fuck? Legendary trader George Soros served the Nazi occupation of Hungary and arrived in London as an impoverished college student and has a now a net worth of 24.2 billion. It is insane. After his father died, business magnate Li ka had to quit school to help support his family and now is 27.1 fucking billion dollars worth. College dropout Shelton Edelson grew up sleeping on the floor of a Boston tenant tenement house or whatever and is now worth 29.5 billion. Oracle co-founder what the fuck Larry Ellison dropped out of college after his adoptive mother died and he held odd jobs for eight years. And now, which is the last person, by the way, is net worth 49.8 billion. Born in Brooklyn, New York, to a single mother, Ellison was raised by his aunt and uncle in Chicago. After his aunt died, Ellison dropped out of college and moved to California to work odd jobs for the next eight years. He founded software development company Oracle in 1977, which is now one of the largest technology companies in the world. And now let's fucking say that you just are not good enough, that you can't do whatever, and you're listening to the fucking people that are telling you that you can't do whatever you're willing to do, because you fucking can. You fucking can, because if these people, if 17 people have been able to do this from the bottom up to the very, very top, which just really includes a lot of hard work, I assume... And then you also are able to do something like that. You know, we are all able, in theory, practically, I don't know. You know, because I also think that you have to have certain qualities to being able to do something like that. You know, I do just have a feeling. And I do not even want to say that I'm having those qualities. You know, not necessarily. I don't know. I'm going to see, you know. Uh, one of the th these things that I'm actually lacking in is not working enough, I guess, you know, in terms of actual work that gives me some money. I work a fucking lot in terms of the podcast, in terms of the whole social media thing, but I'm not doing enough that actually gives me any money, you know, because I'm not earning any money at this point in time. But let's actually go through another one, but I don't know which one. Maybe let's take much of it. You know, does it mean that he was worth more than? But never mind, I'm gonna go ahead. Uh, he now runs Las Vegas Sands, the largest casino company in the world and is considered the most high-profile political donor in America. Which is, can be something good, which can also be something bad. You know? On the other hand, I have to say, like, if you're a donor, which I think he's donating to uh, politicians to give them money and to basically uh, um, let them be able to do uh, whatever they're doing, I guess the only problem there can be that I don't know, you're like, like if you're doing this and people know it, then I don't know if everyone's willing to be your partner and everyone is willing to just do business with you just because they know that you might be just sponsoring, quote unquote, or donating to, uh, to the political sites that you're not really a fan of, quite. But yeah, you know, let's talk about frugality, you know, because this is actually something that I have seen um, might be a relatively big part of why people can be successful, why people get successful. And one of them definitely is Mark Cuban. The funny thing is he's even not on the list. Um, but he said, if I'm actually able to find it, um, do I actually have to make it bigger? I actually have to make it bigger to just... Well, uh, the point he made was that um, you, you somehow have to be frugal in the first place and you have to be able to... Um, to, first of all, save money and make money to be able to invest your money, which is one of the best ways to just be one of the people in this rich club, quote-unquote. And uh, the problem there is that you are going to fail and whatnot. I'm actually, I'm going to make it bigger so you're not going to be able to see it, but I'm going to read it. Um, the world views of billionaires are often skewed by the compulsion to appeal to romantic notions about their own heroism and reinforced memes derived from a common repository of cultural kitsch. Uh, sitting his own life struggles, celebrity billionaire Mark Cuban argues in favor of voluntary austerity as the key to becoming rich. Promoting the values of civilization which everyone is expected to dream of being a billionaire, he, off he offers inspiring but at the same time heavily moralizing advice to the rest of struggling America. 
Uh, Cuban remembers a book that inspired him when he was young, How to Retire at 35. He sums up his key message, which seems to believe the average Jan and Joe in the street could apply and achieve their dream if they simply put their mind to it. The whole premise of the book was that if you could save up a million and live like a student, you could retire. Yes, you could. It's not going to be a, a pretty nice life, but you're going to be rich per definition, basically. But he said something else as well. Um, he was definitely very, 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 very poor. Um, oh, I've actually... <laughs> I've actually, I'm letting you see it as well. I've actually colored it or highlighted it. In other contexts, Cuban has all sorts of ideas about not so much how to get rich, but how to get richer, using strategies and tactics that uh, have nothing to do with frugality or husbandry. He assumes that wise investment is the key to, ent to enter in the class of the very rich, but, the, but that the only way to acquire that wisdom is to be frugal and safe. Hmm. As he says, instead of coffee, drink water. Instead of going to McDonald's, eat mac and cheese, which is homemade macaroni, as they actually explain it as well, with melted cheese. And as everyone should, no should now know, McDonald's is where you should go only when you've attained the level of wealth of Warren Buffett. Yes, <laughs> you maybe should. I'm not sure about that. But uh, the point is, you maybe need to be frugal. And as I found out by... Um, uh, yeah, re I do not want to call it research because I just looked it up really, 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 just quickly. Frugality is one of the things that also the Stoics have already been doing. You know, they've already been living a very, very minimalistic life and a very frugal life. You know, not a really kind of fancy life. You know, they only had what they need. And it was also one of the kind of um, just most important things well, not, I don't know if this, if it was just a really important thing for them, but it is definitely something that they did, you know, living, um, for example, a dedicated amount of time without just basically nothing, eating plain food, uh, just sleeping on the floor and all those things. But what is frugality? Frugality is the quality of being frugal, sparing, thrifty, burden, or economical in the consumption of consumable resources such as food, time, or money, and avoiding waste, lavishness, or extravagance. In behavioral science, frugality has been defined as the tendency to acquire goods and services in a restrained manner and resourceful use of already owned economic goods and services to achieve a longer-term goal. And they also point out some strategies here on the Wikipedia page, uh, which is going to be down in the description, you know, so if you want to check it out, please check it out. And if you do not want to check it out, then please don't check it out. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> so common strategies of frugality include the reduction of waste, curbing costly habits and suppressing instant gratification by means of fiscal self-restraint, seeking efficiency, avoiding traps and defiant def expensive social norms, detecting, detecting and avoiding manipulative adverse advertising, embracing cost-free options and using Parta, and staying well-informed about local circumstances and both market and product service realities. Frugality may contribute to health by leading people to avoid products that are both expensive and unhealthy when used to access, like alcohol and, you know, whatever. Frugal life is mainly practiced by those who aim to cut expenses, have more money and get the most they possibly can from their money, and those that are willing to be rich in the far future, maybe, you know, it, it is going to take some time, you know, and you're going to have to just sign up for, um, I don't know, living a life in frugality for quite some time, I would say, you know, it's not going to be like, okay, I'm going to say for a year, it, you know, of course, it depends on just how much money you already make, but uh, most often, if you're just saving for a year, I don't know if you're then going to be able to retire, probably not, but yeah, Princeton, you know, uh, this is the Princeton site, and I found a book that is called uh, The Wisdom of Frugality, which is 2,500 years old by Emrys Westercott. I think it is translated by this person. And um, yeah, I'm going to read kind of the just overview they give us. From Socrates to Torio, most philosophers, moralists, and religious leaders have seen frugality as a virtue and have associated simple living with wisdom, integrity, and happiness. But why? And are they right? Is a taste for luxury fundamentally misguided? If one has the means to be a spent thrift, is it foolish or uh, 
reprehensible to be extravagant. In this book, Amrys Westercott examines why for why for for more than I'm sorry for than two milli millennia, so many philosophers and people with a reputation for wisdom have been advocating frugality and simple living as the key to the good life. He also looks at the at why most people have ignored them, but argues that it that in a world facing uh, environmental crisis, it may finally be time to listen to the advocates of a simpler way of life. The wisdom of frugality explores what simplicity means, why it's supposed to make us better and happier, and why, despite its benefits, it has always been such a hard sell. The book looks not only at the arguments in favor of living frugally and simply, but also at the case that can be made for lux luxury and extravagance, including the idea that modern economics require lots of getting and spending. A philosophically informed reflection rather than a polemic, the wisdom of frugality ultimately argues that we will be better off as an individual and as a society if we move away from the materialistic individualism that currently rules. And just doing something that makes us happy. I know, because of course, uh, having like just 15 cars and what the fuck ever is cool. Like, I assume it is cool, I don't fucking know. But is it going to make you happier? Probably not. You know, at least this is what I believe. This is, you know, what I think about. This is what I talk about. But, you know, I don't know. I'm not having 15 cars at this point in time. I maybe will in the future. You know, I don't know. I, ho I actually hope I'm not going to have that. You know, and I also think that most often, yeah, you know, it is, yeah, it is difficult because, um... It is difficult because most often when I'm seeing some people that are just really living an extravagant life, you know, a life that is just really fucking expensive, I don't know, you know, but, it, you know, it also comes up to which, you know, how much of their life you're seeing, you know, because some people on YouTube or other social media sites, they are showing off their money, you know, they're showing off what they're earning and what, the, and some people, for example, PewDiePie, he's not really showing um, what he's having, like, yeah. You know, and I, by the way, think that he's also relatively frugal with his life, you know, and that he isn't in need of much things. You know, some people are completely different, you know, they're having a fucking Lamborghini and all those things, which is also fine. You know, it, I'm not going to debate about that. I'm not going to be unhappy about that or just be like, well, you are a piece of shit if you're having a Lamborghini. No, I don't say so. But I do not necessarily think that it is going to be a good investment nor is it going to be making you happier in the long term. But yeah, um, I've also found another site, How to Get Rich by Practicing the Philosophy of Stoicism. Um, it is very, like, clickbaity, and also the site is kind of clickbaity, but, you know, um, just take it with a grain of salt, I would say. The principal, principal one is live below your means. Frugality makes a poor man rich. As Seneca the Younger says, Seneca from basically or probably uh, the letters of a Stoic or from a Stoic actually, um, which is by Seneca and which is from the conversation between Seneca and uh, Lucilius. So if you want to get rich fast, you need to value things that are cheap. It is no surprise that Warren Buffett is worth more than 78 fucking billion yet still lives in the same house that he bought in 1958 for $31,000. And he doesn't need more. You know, he doesn't fucking need more. This is exactly what he says about this. My life couldn't be happy. In fact, I would be worse if I had six or eight houses. So I have everything I need to have and I don't need any more because it doesn't make a difference after a point. As Warren Buffett said. It is not that he is a cheap person. It is because he thinks that he values are, that he values are cheap. That he values are cheap. That he values cheap? Whatever. He doesn't really care about looking rich. All he cares about is maintaining a certain lifestyle while seeing the numbers grow. So after studying so many successful people, I too wanted to take this ideal into account and apply it into my own lifestyle. Now, instead of valuing things like fancy houses and nice cars, I value things like freedom and travel so much more. And I put myself in the situation of being frugal and practicing minimalism because it just makes me focus on only the essential things without worrying about all the useless crap. Or as Mark Cuban says... The more you stress over bills, the more difficult it is to focus on your goals. The cheaper you can live, the greater your options. Yes, totally. You know, it makes sense. The second principle is live as if you will die in 10 years. Or as Seneca says, 
you squander time as if you drew from a full and abundant supply. Through all the while that that, uh, that day which you bestow on some person or thing is perhaps your last. I don't really get it, <laughs> to really be honest. But the third principle is, I'm gonna now headline read. The third principle is, every challenge you face is good for you. Or as Seneca says it, a gem cannot be polished without friction, nor a man without trials. Principle four, live as if you were already rich. The happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. Which, like, which really goes into the direction of uh, faking till you make it. Which is something that I'm not really a fan of. But I understand, you know, and Marcus Aurelius, he's a fucking interesting person. You know, I might be actually talking about it, about him in the next episode. I think I'm gonna do that. You know, because I'm having to record another one today, even though I've actually pre-recorded everything. You know, I'm, I'm already done, basically. But it's fine, you know, it is fine. Principle five, only, knew, only you know what is best for you. We all love ourselves more than other people, but care more about their opinion than our own as Marcus Aurelius said it. And this was the last one. And therefore, it is also going to be the end of the episode. You know? And uh, I hope you've liked it. You know, I hope I've been able to just show you some things. I hope that I've been able to just give you some thoughts and give you some, some inspiration as well, I would say. You know, which is really important uh, to change your mind. And this is what I'm willing to do here. So yeah, um, I am going to see you the next time. I at least hope, and uh, we're going to see what the future is going to hold for us or is holding for us. And therefore, I wish you the best health of happiness and also success, and also hope that you're going to remind yourself and you're going to be remembered. It basically means your legacy, which basically means just being a nice person and then also being remembered as a nice person. Yeah. And uh, three other <laughs> questions that I'm having for you are, why are you here? What are you trying to change? And what is bothering you the most? These three uh, are hopefully going to show you your purpose and maybe even a business idea. Since a lot of companies started out with solving something that really pissed them off in the first place. And now you're having a business, you know, and there's probably also something that really pisses you off. And by changing that, you're then having a business. And voila, you're having a business. By also kind of solving a problem for yourself and also other people. Amazing. But I'm going to see you the next time. I at least hope. So please subscribe to the podcast and also to the YouTube channel. I would appreciate that. I really would. And I'm going to see you the next time.